efforts to 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 uh, have the uh, the right word, the right expression. Uh, we even spent some days just uh, exchanging uh, translation from the uh, a poem of uh, Joaquin Sabina. So uh, she she is really uh, the, the the key element in the translation of the book. I should also uh, thank uh, Bernhard and Cami for being present here now in the uh, as panelists, and also. Uh, my son, my son uh, Martin, who was the designer of the cover of the book, and uh, also some colleagues in the diplomatic uh, service of Peru, especially in in Washington and Guatemala, who were the uh, the persons who looked for some of the elements that I needed to sustain some of the arguments that uh, you will hear in the presentation. Well. Uh, Let's, let's follow a little bit uh, this uh, PowerPoint that gives you a, a, an idea of what is contained in, in the book. Uh, let's do the, the first. Uh, okay, the origin of the, uh, of the word Pisco, it's uh, pre-Columbian. That's before the Spaniards arrived to, to America, to South America. The, the Pisco is a Quechua word that means birds. And, and, and uh, if you have been there sometime, you will realize that it's the perfect name for the place because there are thousands and thousands of birds in that area of uh, coastal Peru. Uh, and the name that was used by the Incas before the Spaniards was kept by, by the Spaniards later on in, in, the, uh, in that area of the coast of, of Ica in, in southern Peru. Uh, what the image that you see here is the image of the first map that was made of Peru. This map was made in 18, uh, wait, wait a little bit. Uh, this map was made in 18, uh, in 1584 by a cartographer named Diego Mendes. And this map was part of the atlas uh, made here in, in, in what is now Belgium uh, by, by the famous cartographer Ortelius. The map appears in the third edition, starting in the third edition of uh, the atlas of Ortelius. Let's go to the next uh, please. Uh, in the case of documents, uh, Lorenzo Huerta, who is a great uh, researcher from the University Ricardo Palma in Peru, he found some years ago the first document that mentions the spirit, not with the name Pisco, but the production of a spirit in, in Peru. This document is from 1613, and, and, and it's uh, the uh, document where a Greek person, Pedro Manuel the Greek, who used to live there in, in Ica, uh, lives to, as an inheritance, part of uh, his uh, goods. And one part was 30 jars of uh, spirit. So you could imagine how valuable was this product for, for a person to put as part of the legacy to, to his uh, sons and daughters this 30 uh, jars of, uh, of spirit. As I said, this is the very first mention that we have up to now in Peru about the production of, of the spirit. Next, please. But uh, by the end of, uh, of the 17th century, already uh, exists a, a very dynamic trade of Pisco uh, between different provinces in the coastal, south, southern coastal Peru and, and, and Lima. Why? Because Lima, Callao was the main port in that uh, area of the Pacific. So all the uh, small ports send their, their products to Callao in order to be shipped in larger ships and from there distributed to uh, the whole of the uh, Spanish America. As, as you will see in this, uh, this chart, the, uh, the amount of uh, Pisco uh, spirit that was sent from Pisco to 
uh, uh, Lima to Callao in the year 1680 was almost 11,000 clay jars. That, that gives you the, the whole idea of the, the, the enormous production of uh, the spirit in, in, uh, in the southern part of Lima. At that time, the, the main export was wine, but uh, one third was pisco. In, in, the, in the subsequent years, the uh, proportion is reversed because the, uh, the trade between uh, Callao and many areas of America was uh, prohibited by, by the Spanish crown. So the uh, people who produce uh, wine start to transform the wine in spirit, which uh, it's uh, better to be kept. It's uh, smaller in, 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 in volume compared to, to, to wine and uh, was traded, also had the possibility to be traded later on. The next, and, and uh, uh, the next slide, uh, please. The, uh, here in this, this uh, second chart, you can see that in, uh, in the beginning of 18th century, between the years 1701 and 1704, Peru was already an exporter of spirit to, to Chile. In, in those uh, four years, uh, there are statistics that was uh, were found by uh, an historian, a Peruvian historian, uh, uh, Mr. Moreira Pasoldan in, in the 1960s. And, and, and you will see that uh, the, uh, the clay jars of uh, spirit coming from Peru went to Valparaíso, to Valdivia, to Concepcion, the three main ports in, in Chile. So there was a steady uh, export from, from Peru towards uh, Chile of the, uh, the spirit. But uh, what we are uh, dealing with in, in the book is when and how this uh, beverage start to be called pisco. And uh, you will see in the next slide that the, uh, the first reference that we have found about the, uh, the name Pisco, Aguardiente de Pisco, it's uh, the registry of a, a ship, a ship called Our Lady of the Solitude that was sent from Peru, from Callao to Acapulco in Mexico. This ship, when, when arrived to, to Acapulco, was sold. And the, uh, the buyer, again, shipped the whole uh, uh, shipping in, 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 the, in, the, in, in the boat towards Central America, towards Guatemala. And, and in the registries that uh, were presented in uh, Acapulco, as well as in Guatemala, when the, the ship arrives, there, uh, there's the uh, declaration that they were uh, carrying 70 botijas, clay jars of aguardiente de pisco. And this is repeated in several of the documents that are presented for the payment of, uh, of the uh, tariffs that should be uh, uh, paid to the Spanish authorities with the arrival of goods to, to Spanish ports. In the, in the documents that we found with a lot of the help of my friends from, from the Embassy of Peru in Guatemala, especially Ambassador Mendes and, uh, and Carlos Rossi, uh, we see that the, uh, there's even the name of the person who shipped the, the, the clay jars towards uh, uh, Acapulco. Even the way the, way the, the clay jars were uh, found and, 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 and stored in the ship. All these details are in the, in the registry that uh, the owner of the ship present to the Spanish authorities in Acapulco as well as in, uh, in Nicaragua, which was the final destination of the ship. Uh, you will see that in this international trade, could we go to the next piece? Uh, um, the, the, the cons consistent use of, of, of the name Pisco is present in, in trade. In, in 1742, we have another ship. This, this is 
uh, a ship uh, that arrived to uh, Central America, to Guatemala, and in the, in the manifest of the ship says that the, the, the ship carries 16 clays of Pisco. They don't, don't even mention uh, spirit or aguardiente. They say 16 clays of Pisco directly. But as well, the, uh, the, not only in trade, Pisco was already a very popular product in trade, but as well in law. In, in, uh, uh, let's go to the next. In 1729, uh, in Lima, in the uh, Audiencia de Lima, the, 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 the legal courts of Lima, there was a lawsuit. This was a lawsuit against uh, the uh, account, uh, a, a Peruvian account who has left uh, many uh, goods and, and farms to uh, his uh, sons and daughters. And there was uh, a lawsuit against them. A part of the lawsuit is to determine what was the price, the preci precise price of uh, Aguardiente de Pisco in the year 1726. So in this lawsuit, the, uh, one of the parts present uh, several witnesses that present documents and give testimony about the price of Pisco in the year 1726. And, and, uh, and uh, as, as you will see, maybe you can read it in the, uh, this uh, piece of, of, the, uh, of the lawsuit, uh, that it mentions that they were buying Aguardiente de Pisco in order to sell it to cities as Guayaquil and Tierra Firme. Tierra Firme was the, uh, the, 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 the use, the name that was used to uh, name uh, Central America, especially the uh, captaincy general of uh, Guayaquil. So for, for Peruvians already in the beginning of, of, of the 18th century, the trade and the use of name Pisco to uh, establish uh, a trade and, and, and the exchange between, between Peru and, and many areas of, uh, of uh, South America and, and Central America, it was very common. It was a, a product that was part of our export. So, so we have been exporting Pisco for more than 300 years. We are a traditional exporter of Pisco since, since the, uh, the end of 16th century and the, the beginning of uh, uh, the end of 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century. Let's go to the next. But also later on in, in, in the 19th century, there are many reference to the production and the trade of Pisco from Peru. I, 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 I have chosen some of the most emblematic ones. This is a, a, a book that was published by a, a Swiss traveler. Uh, Jacobo Bonchudi. This, this person traveled uh, through Peru at the beginning of the 19th century. And he published a book about the, uh, his experiences in Peru. And, and, and he has this very particular reference which uh, illustrates the, uh, the importance of Pisco and how it was distributed, distributed in South America. He says that the grapes in Pisco the grapes are of superior quality, very succulent and sweet. The great part is used for making brandy, which is extremely good and very well flavored. All Peru and great part of Chile are supplied with this liquor from the Valley of Ica. The common brandy is called Aguardiente de Pisco because it's shipped from that port. So, what, what Shudi recognizes here is the, the, the trade that has been taking place since the, eight, the end of the, of the eight, uh, 17th century. Uh, and, and it was an industry, a very well, a cent, more than a century uh, old industry in that area of Peru by, by the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, let's go to the next. In, in, um, 
uh, mid uh, 18th century, there was a book published in the US. This, this was um, a, a book, especially about the uh, West Coast of the US. And, and there's in the book, there's uh, uh, the presence of a, a, a character named the Cornell who visits uh, San Francisco. And there he has a chat with uh, one of the, the locals and, and the local mentioned Pisco. And, and the Cornell said, what, what's Pisco? Oh, come on, I'm, I'm going to teach you uh, what is Pisco. And that starts a, a, a visit to bars in San Francisco where the popularity of Pisco was enormous. That is because since the uh, gold rush in, uh, in, in 1859, many Peruvians went as well to California to, to try to make the Americas uh, looking for gold in, in, in California. And they brought with them Pisco. And Pisco became very popular around San Francisco and California. Even they, they, they create uh, in, in the 19th century, a very popular drink that was called Pisco Punch. That uh, now we are again uh, drinking with the, the old recipe from, from the 19th century. As you may see in this, uh, this uh, image, in one of the uh, prints included in the book, there's uh, this bar in San Francisco with uh, the title, Drinking Pisco in a San Francisco Saloon. And you will see a character uh, apparently took too many Pisco punch because he, he cannot stand this uh, there in a, in a chair and, 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 a, and a dog is barking. So, but all, not only not only was in in um, in the U.S. where the uh, aguardiente de pisco was recognized, you will see the next the next uh, slide. This is a reference that uh, was found some years ago when I was ambassador in China. And at, at the end of the 19th century, the Qing Empire start to send missions all over the world. That is because China has been closed by centuries. And the European countries, even the Latin American countries, Peru was present in China from, from uh, 1874, the first country who established diplomatic relations with the, the uh, Chinese empire, the Qing empire. So in those years, the, uh, the Qing Empire sent special envoys all over the world to report to the emperor about the customs, the uh, defense, uh, the, the uh, geography of different countries. And, and, and uh, in uh, the year 1889, they sent a mission that went to, to the US, Cuba, Brazil, and also Peru. And the guy in charge of the mission was this person that you see there, Fu Yulong. And, and, and he reported very thoroughly every place that he touches and, and describes. And this is the description that is written in that part of his report about the day where he arrives on February the 2nd, 1889 to Pisco and said, uh, we dock in Pisco, the drink called Pisco comes from here. So at the end of the 19th century, already a report sent by uh, Fu Yulong to the emperor of China reflects that the, 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 the Pisco spirit was produced in Peru and, and, and was shipped and, and the origin was um, the port of Pisco uh, in, in Peru. But also this recognition of the origin of, of Pisco is not only done in Peru or US or China. Also our friends in, 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 at the South in, in Chile, they recognize the origin of Pisco. Let's see the next slide. One of the most famous uh, linguists 
in, in, uh, in Chile is called Orestes Plat. He's, that's a, a, a pseudonym, not, it's not his real name, but he wrote a, a dictionary of Chilean expressions. And one of the expressions that is used, used also in, in Chile is pisco sour. But when he explains the pisco sour, he explains that, uh, the, that the pisco used to prepare pisco sour eh, eh, is, used to be called pisco great spirit, aguardiente de pisco, because it came from that place, pisco in Peru, the province of Ica in Peru and says it's fertile and rich in vineyards, the name of the city has become as well known as Cognac, the clay jars, clay jars in which the legitimate grape from Pisco was imported was also known as Pisco. The truth is that the name of the product comes from the Peruvian town. And this is, I would say, the most important linguist in, in Chile which recognized that the origin of the, of the drink and the name is uh, the, the port of Pisco in Southern Peru. But not only this, this uh, linguist give testimony of the, the origin, but also they are reference to the quality, the quality of Pisco. Let's see the next. Uh, in mid 18th, 19th century, in Spain, there was published this encyclopedia on uh, literature, science, arts, agriculture, industry, and commerce. And this encyclopedia touches on many areas of the, uh, the uh, trade and, and, and production in Spain. And they, are, they have a reference to the production of, uh, of uh, eau de beef of spirit in Spain. And he mentions that the author mentions that the, the, the spirits are, are produced with a high level of perfection in Catalonia and Andalusia. And from Catalonia, a great amount is sent to France to uh, be transformed into cognac. And then he uh, mentions a, a, a criticism, say generally our spirits are too rough. It will be good for our producers to adapt the vines and the production methods used in Peru to manufacture that incomparable Pisco spirit. So in mid uh, 19th century in Spain, already was a, a very prestigious recognition of the high quality of the Peruvian spirit. Uh, when we go into the 20th century, we have to, to see that the, the great market that was in the East Coast or in the West Coast of uh, the US for Pisco since mid uh, 19th century abruptly closes. And closes in, uh, in 1919 because of the prohibition. Uh, let's go to the next one. The provision was the, uh, this uh, called the uh, uh, law the, uh, to, that was uh, created in, in, in 1990 in the US in order to prohibit the consumption of alcoholic beverage in the US. In the US. This prohibition lasts from 1990 to 1933 and was uh, 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 a constitutional amendment change the, uh, the situation of the consumption of uh, spirits and, and alcoholic beverage in, in general, not only spirits. And at that time, Peru tried to regain the access to the, the market, especially as I said, in the West Coast in, in the US. But suddenly our embassy realized that in the West Coast of the US, uh, there were products that were circulated with the name of Pisco and that were not coming from, from Peru. So our embassy in, in Washington, the ambassador, the person who you will see in that, in that slide, Ambassador 
Manuel de Freire in Santander, a very prestigious Peruvian ambassador, he, he uh, prepared a report to the State Department and to other um, secretaries in, in Washington reporting on the production of Pisco, on the, the uh, denomination of the spirit and the uh, claiming the exclusivity of the use of the name for the uh, Peruvian product. The, uh, the, the process of this claim done by the Peruvian embassy was very successful because uh, in, in, in the year 1935, let's go to the next uh, uh, slide, the, uh, the, the US government uh, issue a uh, regulation on false, false advertisement of uh, distillate uh, spirits. And there, the US government establishes that the uh, only the name of a, a spirit related to a geographical uh, place could be used if that spirit came from the place name uh, in, in, in the label. So in the case of Pisco, only could come from Peru, but not only in, in, in the uh, regulation, the US government uh, put some examples like uh, cognac, armagnac, Greek brandy, and Pisco brand. Pisco was one of the examples of a place where should be, the name should be reserved just to the country from where uh, the name of the, locate, the, the place is, is located. Of course, this creates a, a tremendous disappointment for, for our friends in Chile, because they wanted as well to, to export a product they call uh, as well Pisco to the US. But the regulation was uh, a, a tremendous hurdle to, to participate in the, uh, the reopening of the uh, US market. So then uh, they, they did a, a very peculiar, I would say, uh, legal maneuver in order to, to claim as well the possibility to go into the US market. Let's go to the next. The, uh, the, the Congress man from that area was named Gabriel Gonzalez Videla. And, and uh, he wrote a very extensive memory, it has more than uh, 1500 pages. And, and in the area, in the, in the section which is related to the Pisco, he indeed confessed that uh, his idea was to in order to get access to the US market to change the name of the city, of a city in Chile. And this is what, what he did between December 1935 and, uh, and uh, February uh, 1936, he pro proposed a very succinct, very small law changing the name of the city La Union to Piscoelqui. And he thought, well, now we have the problem solved. Now we do have as well our Pisco in, in Chile. Of course, there's, there's, this creates a, a very strange geographical and an administrative paradox because they, they used to pro produce a, 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 a spirit that they call Pisco, but the name of the place that's supposed to give name to the, the drink came after the name of the drink, and and uh, and, and clearly in the records that are in, in his memories, but as well in the debates in the in the Chilean Congress, it's clearly established that this was a, a maneuver, a, a strange uh, uh, change of name, just to get access to the American market. But as as uh, we have this use of the name in trade and in, in legal procedures. Also, we can see that the name Pisco is, has been used in the arts. And, and this is something that I, 
I, I really cherish looking for because there are a lot of very interesting uh, mentions of Pisco in, in different, in different uh, types of art um, on, on artistic uh, uh, works. Let's go to the next. You will see there several uh, images. The one, the one on the on the left, it's uh, a watercolor by Pancho Fierro. Pancho Fierro was one of the great uh, painters of the 18th, 19th century in Peru. And there you see one, one uh, watercolor of a muleteer carrying uh, pisco, pisco clay jars uh, to normally coming from Southern Peru to Lima. The second image is about a novel, a novel called uh, The Travel Around the World in La Numancia. This is, was written at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, by one of the greater Spanish writers, Benito Perez Santos. And, and, and the history is a history of a, a sailor that goes looking for uh, his daughter that uh, has escaped Spanish. The, uh, Spain, Spain because she was eloped by a, by a Peruvian guy which uh, brings her to, to Peru and, and the guy goes after uh, her, her daughter and, and, and in, one, in one of the uh, pages of the, of the novel he mentioned the products that uh, he drinks and eats in Peru and, and he says there that uh, there's this uh, this uh, spirit in Peru called pisco, which is excellent. And if you drink the, the pisco, you will see God. That's the expression that is used in, in, in the novel. Also that the novel has a, a several reference to Peruvian dishes like uh, arroz con pato, uh, uh, rice with duck, and, and also the ceviche is mentioned and, 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 and as, one uh, last uh, praise of, the, of, of, of Peruvian culture, uh, Benito Perez Galdós mentions also the, the, the Peruvian women as the most beautiful women in the world. I, I'm certain he, he's very right. The, uh, the next one you see is Herman Melville. Herman Melville, is the, as, of course, as you all know, is the author of Moby Dick. He wrote a, 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 a collection of, uh, of stories called Las Encantadas. And there, there's a story about a Peruvian woman who was left abandoned in an island in the, in South, in the South Pacific. And that was some years later, saw by a ship that uh, went by the island. But the guy who, who saw very from far away, this woman in the island, says that why he saw this, the white handkerchief of the woman, maybe that was because that day he was given a, a ration of Peruvian pisco by, by, by the, uh, the cook in the ship. And maybe because of that, he was very keen to see the, 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 the white handkerchief in the horizon. Also Kipling, the, the, the Nobel Prize, uh, Rudyard Kipling, he, he uh, wrote a book uh, called From Sea to Sea. In, 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 the, in the book, he refers to many places. And one of the places he visited was San Francisco. And there he was presented with a punch supposedly made with pisco. And, 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 and the description that Kipling did about this cocktail says it's made of, a, of the wings of a caribbean and the uh, poems of the ancient poets. And, and this is the most sublime, sublime product of our age. The, uh, the uh, Jeffrey Houseful is a British writer who wrote uh, a short uh, collection of stories. And the main story is called The Salvation of Pisco Gavar. And Pisco Gavar is one of the characters in the, in the story. And, and he explains in the book that the guy was called Pisco Gavar, it was his nickname, because he cannot travel in Peru without a, a very good half liter of Pisco, which was the best, best tool to uh, have conversation with uh, his friends 
in, in, in the loneliness of uh, loneliness of Peruvianandis. And, and the, the, the last one that you see there, it's Tantan uh, Tintin, and, and a, a very well-known character in uh, European and, and, and world uh, culture. This is uh, a story called, uh, in English is Prisoners of the Sun, in Spanish and French is uh, El Templo del Sol, the Templo du Soleil. And in one of the first pages of the Prisoners of the Sun, you see Tantan as his friend, Captain Hadot, who went to, to, to Peru to look for his friend who has been kidnapped. And uh, the, the local authority uh, receives uh, Tantan and, and Hadot and offers them a, a glass of this excellent drink of the country, Pisco. And, and, and a few uh, draws uh, later, you see Captain Hadot, which in the story is uh, uh, very famous because he likes very much his drinks. And, and he says, uh, well, this Pisco, what a Pisco, this is the most, the happiest day, days, day in my life. So Pisco made he stayed very, very, very happy at the time. Nowadays, we have, uh, we have a, a, a very well-established distribution and recognition of Pisco all over the world. Let's go, let's go to the next. Currently, we have 76 countries that recognize Pisco as a Peruvian appellation of, of origin of geographical indication in, all over the world. If we in Peru would ratify the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership 11, which is in, in, in the Congress now, uh, four new countries would be included, New Zealand, Malaysia, Brunei, and Australia. So you will see there's a, a very significant uh, number of countries that recognize Pisco as a Peruvian um, beverage. Uh, let, me, let me tell you a Few, a few ref, uh, reflections that I, I may have on the future, because we have been talking of, about the past of Pisco as a way to project towards the future. But I think it's important to see that the, um, the birth certificate that we have in the history uh, for Pisco in the case of Peru should be complemented in the future with uh, measures of projections like, like the ones that I uh, mentioned here. First, we have to, to strive to, to, to make and show international Peru as a distinctive eau de vif uh, spirit from Peru. And, 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 and this would require an improved marketing strategy all over the world. Uh, one of the examples that we are talking before the, this, this uh, conference was maybe to use the example of tequila. Tequila is a very successful uh, Latin American drink that has been popular for, for many years all over the world. But one of the examples how to make, uh, how the tequila became popular was the margarita. The margarita was one of the tools that Mexico and international bartenders used to make popular uh, the, the, the tequila. Maybe we, we can think on Pisco Sour, which is already very popular, but other, other, other different uh, cocktails because the, uh, the Pisco from Peru is very versatile. So could be mixed and could create many cocktails. Maybe one, one idea would be to be make popular uh, a drink made of uh, pisco all over the world. Uh, here in, 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 in Belgium, we had some years ago an initiative that was promoted by Prom Peru, the agency to promote the image of Peru, and, and especially Rosario Pajuelo, who used to be the trade officer here in, in Belgium. This idea was called the Pisco College. We had uh, sessions where we uh, gather uh, bartenders, distributors, uh, critics uh, for, for a night to have uh, a speech like the one I, I'm giving to you now about the history of Pisco 
an explanation of the economics around Pisco, and also we make a tasting of Pisco with a, with a, a, a Belgian bartender, excellent, who shows the different types of Pisco, what's a, a pure Pisco, what's a natural, what's the difference between a natural regular or a mosto verde. So in that way, create awareness of the different types, the different qualities, the different characteristics that the, uh, the priest Piscos from Peru has. Also, I think it's essential to reinforce the uh, alliance between the public sector and the, and the, and the private sector in, in the promotion and the, 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 the process to make popular Pisco all over the world. The, the private sector is essential, but should have a very important support from, from Peru, from the public sector. We in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where, where I work, and in, in all our embassies and consulates around the world, the, the subject of Pisco is a, a priority. And, and, and you will see all over the world, we have days of Pisco, gastronomic uh, festivals where we show Pisco. So for us, it's a, a never ending task, the promotion of Pisco. But there, I, I think the, the link between the private sector and the public sector should be reinforced. Uh, also, there is an important effort that should be done in terms of registration of Pisco, of the indication of origin or appellation of origin, uh, Pisco all over the world. And we, uh, within the COPI, the National Agency for Intellectual Property in Peru, we are doing that all over the world. Whenever we have the opportunity, we are registering Pisco in different markets. You, you saw there in the, in the previous uh, slide, uh, some of the titles that were given to Peru. In, the, in that case, the two examples were from, from, from Thailand and, and from Ukraine. And, and also, I think it will be very useful to continue with the uh, research, like the small research or the, the, the very modest research I, I've done in order to find new sources, historical uh, documents and, 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 and uh, sources that give the real Peruvian nature and origin of the beverage. Uh, just in the, in the last years, the, the uh, research that we have done in Washington, Guatemala, uh, even here in, in Europe, in the, in the archive of India, Indies in, in Seville, has given uh, uh, very, very, very interesting results, producing documents that uh, reinforce the Peruvian, the real Peruvian origin of, of the drink. And, uh, and, and just to finish this, this uh, uh, speech, I would will, I will like to leave you with uh, a poem that was written by the, uh, the Spanish author, uh, uh, Joaquin Sabina, which I like very much. He wrote uh, the following poem that we will see. Sabina says, said in a, in a poem, may there be good pisco at my wake and a badass Jalisco corrido to send me away. Breathing is a temporary luxury. There's life beyond this life, but it isn't life. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for being uh, with us this evening for Brussels, the morning for, for America. And uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments or observations, I will be very honored to, to try to answer uh, with my little knowledge of Pisco. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. Um, and you're very humble. Your, your book is not a modest investigation. It is incredible. Um, Cami and I were talking about that recently. So we congratulate you and, as we said earlier, I put the links to where you can buy the book in the chat. 
at the top. I'll add them in when I finish speaking so you can see that again. I highly recommend that you buy the book and learn more about it because obviously the ambassador didn't have much time today to cover everything. So um, thank you again. And we're running a little bit late, but I hope you all can stay because we have a really interesting question and answer session coming up. I'll um, try to shorten my comments about the translation project. Um, but as you can see here on the slide, uh, the ambassador incorporated a lot of interesting texts, uh, poems, art, into his um, book, which was very interesting, but it was also very challenging as a translator. Um, for example, this Joaquin Sabina poem drove me nuts for about an entire day. I think I contacted all my friends in Mexico because I was stuck on the word Jalisco. I didn't know what he was referring to. I thought it was maybe a, a mariachi or, or something else, but um, Gonzalo and I worked through that. Um, so that was really interesting and challenging. Um, another thing that came up that I found, found was really interesting was that the ambassador did not want to use the word brandy in his text um, because the International Organization of Vine and Wine does not consider Pisco a brandy because it's not aged. So I had to omit the word brandy after doing the translation. So we worked together on coming up with alternative words. Um, I'm going to change the slide so you can see a few of them that we used in the text. Oops. And some that I've just heard in bars and out when I'm trying to sell Pisco. So you can see some of them there. And this struggle to come up with other words made me aware of a larger maybe issue that I think I have as a brand owner of, of Pisco. And that's that maybe there isn't a universal word or language in English that fully cap, uh, encaptures Pisco. I feel like maybe we don't have sufficient vocabulary in English to capture the historical and cultural significance of Pisco. Um, and I'll show you an example of that after this, but um, I personally, when I go into a, a liquor store in, in the US, I have to go to the brandy section to find Pisco or the specialty spirits section. So I have to go to a really small area in the, in the dark corner and find Pisco. And I think all of us here wanna reach the point where we enter a liquor store outside of Peru and we go to the Pisco section. And there's only Pisco from Peru there. There's not Pisco from other countries there. Um, so what needs to change to get to that point? We heard some really good advice from the ambassador today. Um, and we're going to hear from Burkhardt and Cami. And I think we agree that the first step is collaboration. As Gonzalo mentioned, we need to work together. And the second step is using educational tools like uh, the ambassador's book and Pisco College. And thirdly, I think we can work to define a universal language um, to define Pisco. So we can all think about what is Pisco to all of us? Is it just a clear brandy? Because for me, that doesn't fully describe what Pisco is. And I don't think it's just a grape spirit. I think it is a product that defines a lifestyle and a cultural experience. And I know Burkhardt is gonna talk about that next. So um, I think we can, work together to shape the language a little bit better in English and hopefully reach more English speakers. And to close my comments, I just wanna show you a quick clip from um, the Netflix series, Luis Miguel. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but I came across something that really shocked me and just kind of was like a dagger in my heart, um, was a clip where the actor mentions Pisco in Lima but the translator chose to write ceviche instead of pisco in the subtitles. So I think we all missed out on the chance of more than a million English speakers around the world to learn about the cultural experience of pisco and tying it into Peru. So I'm just gonna show that clip to you really fast. It's about 15 seconds and then we can move on. So here we go, I hope this works. Do you know where this No. No. Es que me ha llegado esta mañana la autorización de un viaje a Lima a su nombre. Me ha extrañado. A tu poderío. Sí, se fue a comprar pisco. Que estoy hablando en serio. Ok, could you all see the subtitles? I hope so. If, uh, but anyway, so the actor said, Pisco going to Lima, associating that cultural experience, but the translator put um ceviche in there so that was disappointing to me so if anybody you have any contacts with netflix maybe we can get that changed um, and hopefully reach more english speaking audiences so um that's all i have to say i think we all here are translators um we're translating the cultural experience of pisco so hopefully we can all work together um 
to improve the category and, and move forward. So thank you very much to the ambassador for this um, experience and this opportunity. And thank you to you all for listening today. I'm going to transition into the question and answer session with Burkhard and Cami. First, I'll introduce Burkhard and ask him the first question. And then Cami, I will introduce you and ask you the second question, if that's okay. Okay, so Burkhard Nesson is an analyst focusing on consumer trends, technology, and cannabis in the beverage industry. As part of Rabobank's unique research team, he works closely with the world's biggest beverage companies to identify opportunities for growth. And he is also co-host of Liquid Assets, the number one podcast for beverage industry insights. So thank you, Burkhard, for coming with us, for joining us today. My first question for you is, Pisco advocates have been waiting for Pisco's moment to happen on a worldwide scale. And I think we all feel like it has not happened yet. Why do you think this is? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, there's never like an exact answer to anything. Uh, everything often comes down to entropy. Um, but I think the, uh, and I think Cammy's going to talk about this as well, but a lot of it comes down to, you know, what is the template that Pisco would want to use to, to move forward. And I think a, a great example would be, um, you know, the, the Mexican spirits, um, not only because they're related being, you know, uh, from Latin America, but, you know, it's a very uh, regional product with very strong domestic consumption, um, great uh, artisanship and, and variety. And, you know, I, I think this is just a very challenging comparison because when you think about the success that you know, tequila and, and, and uh, mezcal as the broader category have had, uh, it's strongly related to the fact that there are 40 million Mexican Americans living in the United States in particular. And, um, you know, uh, uh, Gonzalo did mention that it's really important that uh, we have a drink to, to drive this force, really important to kind of coalesce around a product, a delivery mechanism for the spirit. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's true, but we also need, you know, those 40 million Mexican Americans in the United States are 40 million brand ambassadors out there. And there are large consumer groups. So when you start thinking about how do you get distributors, how do you get retailers on board, they, they want to be able to see that large um, uh, target market. And once you get that critical mass, um, it becomes a lot easier to start, you know, uh, getting celebrity endorsements. You know, uh, we'd love to see Pisco get, uh, you know, George, their own George Clooney. I, I think uh, George Clooney is chose tequila because of the, the market size. He's a businessman, he's thinking about how he can make money. So I think that's really the biggest challenge is that the total addressable market to invest, uh, attract investments and uh, bring on influencers is, is challenged by the fact that, you know, there are uh, 40 times fewer uh, Peruvian and, and uh, uh, dare I say Chilean Americans uh, in the United States. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, that is a good starting place to build a brand at the big market. Um, and from there it can spread to other places. So I think that would be the ideal and it's just hard to realize. Uh, and I think that's probably why it hasn't had its moment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I know Cami's probably gonna elaborate on that a little bit more. Kami, you were gonna probably talk about the Mexico thing, but we might switch a little bit if that's okay. Um, I'll introduce Kami. Um, Kami is an expert in beverages and cocktails. She is partner of Pisco Logia Pisco. And she also works as senior tour coordinator for Experience Agave. So she gives tours in, um, in Mexico. Kami is founder of founder, I'm sorry. Kami is founder of Drink a Seat, which is a project focusing on exploring Latin America through the lens of beverages. And she's currently studying her master's in food studies from NYU. So thank you, Cami. Um, our question for you is, uh, we've all heard the comparison of Pisco and tequila. Um, wait, I'm gonna skip that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cami, what do you think the opportunities there are for the future of Pisco right now? And then maybe we'll go back to. to yeah. Um, yeah, well, thank you for the intro and thank you for inviting me here, Gonzalo. Um, I think your book is like a key um, component to moving forward and establishing Pisco as a category like we all want to see. 
Um, and I think, especially working in Mexico and working in these DOs and seeing the success of the spirits here in Mexico, and, and while simultaneously also having my own brand in, in Pisco, I think, and studying my master's also, I think that technology is going to be uh, imperative moving forward. Um, transparency, environmental impact are all things that we can focus on um, for the Pisco Spirits category. Um, and I think I'm fascinated by blockchain technology. So I would love to see a little bit of that action for Pisco. And while tequila, for example, hasn't gone that way, they've really done, um, they've gone to great lengths to um, really ensure that every bottle that leaves the DO in tequila is exactly what it, what it says it is. And it's things like satellite imagery of the plants and all the way on down to super, supervised barrel aging and everything in between. So I think there's a lot of um, contributions that can be made um, within the DO in that realm. And, and yeah, I would love to see some blockchain action in Peru and Pisco. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that um, kind of blends into the the question that you're going to ask me next, Meg. Right? Is is the the how does Pisco fit into the trends of you know consumption? I think you know when we think about what are driving demand for spirits, it's premiumization, meaning people paying more for products that are of you know similarish quality, uh, uh, uniqueness, functionality, uh, local, mission driven, and uh, route to market, which would include some of that. Uh, digital e-commerce stuff. Um, I, I do think there are some interactions between these things. Local and premium are often similar drivers in the world. And I think that's another challenge that Pisco has is that if you look at the evolution of craft beer and craft spirits in the United States, they are phenomenally local. And you actually see large alcohol companies that have invested in these craft businesses have kind of given up on the idea of it being a nationalizable kind of thing and beer producers or craft beer producers trying to go to Europe and failing because there's just you buy your local brewery because why wouldn't you support your your local businesses um, so I, I do think like the Pisco does have amazing attributes uh, that, that that fit into this I think it's it's really um, probably an awareness problem, uh, to be completely honest. And and um, I would say, or as a general bit of advice, uh, you know, I think that what a lot of people's instinct is, and this is what the wine industry does, is to talk about those great attributes uh, when it comes to origin and uh, ingredients and quality. Um, but I think modern brand building is is built a lot more around lifestyle. And I think if Pisco is going to break through with these kind of structural disadvantages it has, it really needs to have a couple of brands that come through and, and really establish Pisco as a part of a lifestyle or an identity that connects with people that is kind of generalizable and universal or as universal as, as, as that can be. And, and whether that's promulgated through, through a celebrity partnership or some other dimension like that. I, I really think, um, you know, in general, um, being able to link it to something meaningful uh, that, that connects with people's heart rather than their brain, uh, you know, I think that's where Pisco will, will find a way to break through um, because it does have all of those baseline great aspects that, that means it will be successful. It just needs to, um, you know, become a top of mind product for consumers. And I wanted to add to that, I think that that's something that uh, the mezcal DO or mezcal as a category has been really successful at um, because you have super fans of the category that are hanging on to wanting to know all about each species of agave, each production method and what it does for the final product. Um, each terroir, like from north to south in Mexico. And I think there's a way that brands and uh, support from the DO so or any other actors in the sector that can really kind of like push that forward that Pisco is not a monolith. Pisco is so um, diverse in flavors, production methods, and with eight grapes and blends you have something that's not one dimensional. And I would love to see the day where you walk into a bar and it's not just one bottle of Pisco because I've had that experience quite a bit. 
is, oh, what Pisco do you have? And it's one bottle where there's a whole lineup of mezcal. And I think there's absolutely that opportunity with Pisco. And so um, I would love to see it. <laughs> I, I would say that's also true. Getting a, a, a section on the shelf is incredibly important. Same thing with say, you know, non-alcoholic beer. Uh, once, you know, if you're just a little non-alcoholic beer sitting on the shelf, nobody kind of knows you're there. But if there's a whole section and a bunch of brands that speak to you as an individual, it's kind of important to have that, that texture and, and actually get your dedicated shelf space. Um, very, very good. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions for you both, just kind of elaborate more on that. Cami, uh, we heard about the margarita and we've talked about that. And you know, the ambassador suggested that maybe we choose a cocktail that could possibly help you know, promote Pisco across the world. And obviously the Pisco Sour is very famous. Um, can you think of one as a, a bartender that would be a good option that would be sort of a universal cocktail that we could use around the world? Yeah, when I was thinking about the story of the margarita, it's a fascinating story. It's also a U.S. story and it's a, a prohibition era story. And that made me think of the Pisco Punch, which the ambassador was speaking about earlier. Um, and it's delicious. It's an incredible cocktail. And it also highlights um, a single, a pisco puro. So the Ita Italia goes into that cocktail and it's just, it's really exciting. It has a tie to history and it has a specific tie to the US which is an incredibly important market as we all know. So kind of like tying it back to California, San Francisco in the US and drawing on this um, pre-prohibition era time period. Um, and the fascinating thing with that drink also is that it had sort of an illicit secret ingredient. And so I don't think we should make it um, illicit once again, but um, the cocktail as it stands is delightful. So I would push to push that one forth. And I also enjoyed a Te Bidialo in the Andes in Cusco, a really warming drink with tea, ginger, lime, pisco, honey. It's delicious. So either of those two would be my candidates. Okay, great. That sound, those sound like good options. Thank you. Um, Burkhard, do you have any last comments you'd like to make? Um, I know we're all limited on time, so I'll yeah. let you talk and then Cami, I'll ask you the uh, same thing. Vamos Peru. Uh, the guys are playing at, at five o'clock, uh, so so rooting, rooting for, the, for the red and white. Um, would say, um, only that, uh, you know, in prep for this, I actually asked all my buddies. I was like, hey, how do you know Pisco? And it was almost universally, I think it was three or four people that said, oh, I have a Peruvian friend. Oh, I have a, a, a Chilean friend that, that introduced me to it. Um, or or the, the example of, of, of travel, right? So I, I think, you know, there are opportunities. I think there's a lot of great ways to, to recruit people, uh, you know, the, the way people buy products is one way, the way they buy again is based on flavor and quality. Um, so Pisco can always get the second purchase. I think we just uh, need to figure out ways to get that first one. Um, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of, uh, there's a million uh, brand ambassadors out there in uh, the US, a great way to, I just think it's gonna be a, a great place. And I've always asked since I left Pisco um, why it hasn't done that. Um, I think it will if, if we, uh, if it, gets the right support and, and kind of the right circumstances. Okay, thank you. We all hope that happens sooner than later, but we're all working hard <laughs> to make sure it does happen. A bold projection. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Burkhard, thank you so much. Uh, Cami, do you wanna add anything to that or add anything new? Yeah, I would add also that, um, I mean, the company that I work for in Mexico is called Experience Agave. So we do, um, to, we bring people to see the process and it's a four day, very immersive um, vacation for people. And it's not party bus, it's educational. And I think that that would function really well in Peru. And there's a lot of amazing tourism in Peru. So shifting some more of that into Pisco would be great. And I see a comment here um, talking from Juan Luis uh, talking about substituting Pisco in. That's something that I am endlessly advocating for is if it's a vodka cocktail, a gin cocktail, swap it out with Pisco, give it a try. It's really fascinating um, to 
put Pisco into a different uh, framework, cocktail framework. So yeah, the flexibility of Pisco is fascinating. And so try all the drinks. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, well, I think we'll wrap it up now. So all of you who have to do something today, you can you can leave the room. If any of you have any questions, I was just checking through the chat section. I don't see any questions right now, but if you want to stay and, and talk with the ambassador, I don't know, Gonzalo, if you're going to hang out here for a while. Um, but I'd like to thank you all again for coming. Thank you, Cami Burkhardt and Gonzalo for speaking. And I hope we can all work together and meet sometime soon again in a virtual setting or maybe in person. So um, thank you again and congratulations to the ambassador for his wonderful book. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you all. No, thank you. David, gracias por estar. Very nice. Fantastic. Very Muchas much gracias. for the invitation. Thank you very much. See you. Bye bye. bye. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Gonzalo. Liris Monasterio desde Perú. Gracias. Hola. Muy Liris. buena exposición del Pisco. Gracias. Gonzalo, un buenísimo. abrazo. Aquí de Martín Santa Fe, por San Paso. Pisco Kosher. <risa> Pisco Kosher, por San Paso. Ahí está la marca U. Uh, ahí he visto un par de, 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 de señores de la comunidad judía, así que aquí estamos tratando de, de meter eso aquí. ¿Sabes dónde lo hacen? En el alambique de, de los curas salesianos en la Avenida Brasil. Y se trae un rabino para que, para que sepas cómo, cómo, cómo es la historia. Ah, así que está doblemente bendecido. Saludos. Muy bien, muy bien. Excelente idea. Excelente. Muy bien. Gracias, Charlie. Bueno, si no hay. Un ningún... abrazo, Gonzalo. Chao. No, un abrazo. Un abrazo, Gonzalo. Estupenda tu presentación. Gracias, chao. Felicitaciones, embajador. Hasta pronto. Muchísimas gracias. Nada, ah, encantado. Gracias, Gonzalo. Estupendo. Saludos. Gracias, ah, chao. chao. Felicitaciones, embajador. Gracias, muy amable. Bueno. Gracias. Bueno, Meg, I think that's about it. Yeah, así, cierro, ¿no? Gracias, Meg. Sí. Gracias, yeah, gracias a todos. <laughs> okay. Adiós. Chao. Oh.